Here's another segment of my conversation with the great Simon Phillips. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. That, with that first rehearsal, what did that feel like? Was it surreal? Um, was it weird? Um, not for me, but for them, very. Uh, uh, for me, not so much. I had a job of work to do. Yeah. Purely, and, 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 and every time that, that scenario has happened, like the who or whatever, when you step in for someone else, you know, you're being paid to do your job. So be professional and do your job. You know, you can't just do your best. Play the music as best as you can. I've always approached it like that. So we get to rehearsal. We actually, we, we met up for dinner the night before, and I could tell that was very, very difficult. Uh, Luke was the, he was the catalyst. He's the guy going, come on, guys, we're going to make this work. And Paige was just hollow, hollow died. He, he just, he couldn't believe it. He was really struggling. And Mike, struggling, but, but Mike was always, yeah, he's doing his best to, we've got to make this work, you know? Very difficult for all of them. Um, so we went to dinner and we chatted. And I, I mean, frankly, I, I didn't really have a lot to say. I mean, I, it was a very awkward scenario. Mm-hmm. I just felt awkward in it you know but anyway next day we turn up for rehearsal I my kit set up my road is there I tune the drum kit sort out the technical stuff um then by the time we've done all that and weird too because the whole road crew you know they worked with Jeff for years now they've got this new drummer who you know has a very distinctive setup style and opinion too you know and demands <laughs> you know yeah I need this blah 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 and, probably not what they're used to at all. And so, you know, a little bit difficult, but then everybody turns up and we said, and Luke said, right, uh, what do you want to play? And I had all my, uh, you know, charts uh, written out on the plane. I said, um, Hydra. Hydra was one of my favorite songs. And he went, oh, okay, you, 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 want, a, you, you want a nice, easy one to start with, huh? We haven't played that for years. And he said, okay, let's go. And off we go. We played it, and uh, it went went really well. Um, we stopped, and Luke's standing there, and he says to Peyton, Mike, he said, I think this is going to work. And then 21 years later. <laughs> you know, as I've covered your your career, there's a part of me, like I just turned 60. I was born in six, uh, and I was born in 60. There's always yeah. a part of me when I see, and you, you, I'm sure you relate to this, but probably the opposite end of it. When I see young families with kids, there's a part of me going, oh my God, I'm so done. And and there's this, this mindset that's creeping in because I've turned 60. And then I look at a guy like you and you're, I, and well, Bill Bruford just told me he, a little while ago, he says, well, I quit drumming because I couldn't, uh, it wasn't coming to me the way it used to. Uh, but for you, I see you, I mean, I watch you play and you seem like you're on top of your game, but you've always had that hunger, it seems, to to dig a little deeper and go, what happens if I do that? What if, you know, that kind of thing. Has that been your yeah. perspective forever, a bit of, of yeah. working hard? Absolutely, yeah. I, I just, you know, I love, uh, uh, I, I love music and I love creating it and I love playing it. Um, and I think maybe because I spent quite a bit of time, compared to most other drummers, away from the drum kit, so because of engineering, it was another thing that I, I loved records. I love, I grew up in studios because of my dad. So the atmosphere of a studio with a clock on the wall, a green and a red light, which is what it was like in those days, uh, microphone, big heavy ribbon microphones hanging from big stands, screens, gobos, control room, a tape machine. I, I grew up with that. You know, my mom had two Revox G36s which I learned to, to use very, 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 very young age. So, and I would buy albums, not particularly because of the music, but because of the sound. Yeah, I just love, wow, this sounds so great, this record, you know? Um, and to me, that, that, was, that was a very big part of my playing, was, was sound, achieving a sound. Um, so... I got into the engineering side, and thanks to Mike Oldfield in 1983, when I was working with him on Crisis, he noticed that I was so into getting the sounds on the drums. I was fairly technically adept at st- 
stuff to do with recording drums and, you know, not afraid of, uh, you know, fixing stuff like punching in, matching up and playing. And, you know, and he, I think he was really taken by that. And he decided to take me on as an engineer and teach me, basically. And, of course, to me, that was the one thing I'd been wanting to do for years. So working on albums, especially in those days, it would be a month where I wouldn't even touch a drum kit. Yeah, yeah. And that's been like that ever since. I, I've, if I'm mixing a record, I can't even touch a drum. Usually because in the morning I'm like getting up and then breakfast and stuff, and I go, oh, I really fancy a play, and then, but hang on my ears. If I start doing that, I get into the wrong frame of mind. I'm now living this side of the, the glass, as it were. So, you know, sometimes I don't play a drum, pick up a pair of sticks for three or four weeks. Project gets mixed, mastered, finished, and then suddenly I've got a, a playing gig or whatever or a tour, and I'm like, oh, yikes. <laughs> I better just learn how to play again. Um, well, your dad was in a Dixieland band, right? Uh, my dad had his own. He formed his own Dixieland band. Yeah. His first band he formed in 1925 called the Melodians and toured Germany in the 30s. Really? He, in those days, you would do residences. You do six-month residences. Yeah. Uh, so he would go to a jazz club in Berlin, six months. Then he'd go to Munich, six months, Frankfurt. That's how he learned. I think that's how he learned how to speak. He spoke five languages. So he spoke German. Wow. And you can imagine... Germany post-1933, and he was there in, I want to say, 36. Can you imagine what it was like on the streets and at cafes? And you got to put this stuff in the book. You have to put this in the book. It's going in. I, I actually do have transcripts, manuscript of his, his autobiography. It never got published because he left way too much out. Well, he was an intelligence officer in the RAF. Right. He had a very secret life. Uh, half of it I don't even know about. Um, and he was very good at, like all of those people, you know. Uh, he was uh, uh, intelligence, interrogation, and, and debriefing. Mm -hmm. So he probably spoke to, to down German you know, Luftwaffe pilots and had a little chat with them. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know, Um so he was kind of involved in that part, and he put he put music on hold throughout the whole war. Um, but he had been there and seen and hung out in a cafe, drinking a little espresso, and on the next table, I'm sure, you know, there would have been some brown shirts there, S.A., and just, you know, just checking it all out, and wow. And you had a lot of people in Germany at that time who were huge jazz fans, yeah. more underground, and that's why he got booked, you know? Um well, the <laughs> Goebbels soon got rid of all that. Yeah. <laughs> and I've met some, a couple of very interesting older German people um, in, in my travels uh, who were around then and were huge music fans and huge jazz fans and dealing with you know, like their version of speakeasies, basically, yeah. under, under Nazi rule. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it really is fascinating. I always um, tell people, and it, we're losing them all, but my best friend, Karen Betcher, good German girl, I talked to her dad before he died in depth about the Second World War and him fighting on that side because it's always yeah. interesting to get someone else's perspective. I mean, what changes your mind? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, not, I, I'm glad that turned out the way it did, of course. And uh, I'm not a Nazi fan at all, but people are people, and it's a good study on people and to, to really understand what they were going through. Like he even told me, he says, well, we knew we were nuts, but we didn't want our family killed, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and they didn't have a choice. They have a choice. You know, I mean, uh, it really is a, a stunning study. And I, I read all the time. Um, I'm, I'm rebuilding my collection of world war two books because there's a connection because of both my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, and most British kids of my age, we grew up, post-war you know with the rationing was still around after i was born so it, it's hard not to um be into that and uh, i've met, met people here who are huge uh you know world war ii buffs and we you know chat about stuff and you know um i i, I you know it's the biggest conflict 
this world has ever seen, apart from what's going on now, yeah. which doesn't involve tanks. Well, actually, if Trump had his one, Trump would, but there you go. <laughs> By the way, you, you mentioned something a while ago. One thing I really admire about you, and I've talked to a few people lately where I'm in the middle of the interview and I'm going, you still have a curious mind. Your mind's still searching. You know there's more room in there. Because people get old. Like I said, I started falling into that trap of going, oh, I'm 60. I don't want to do any more of this. I don't want to do what, – what, what, what? Like Bill Bruford said the best years of his life were his 60s. Yeah, yeah. It's um, – well, obviously, we never feel the age, do we? We still like to think we're 20 or 30 or 40. Uh, the, the only uh, issue, the only problem is memory. And that's what starts waning. It's hard for me to remember specifics. For example, I read a book by uh, a famous uh, or infamous uh, Luftwaffe uh, flying ace called Adolf Galland. Mm -hmm. He was a fighter pilot. He had, a, it was a very, it was a translated book and very badly transferred. So the print was very small and half the page was empty. It was a, it was a bit of a strange publication. But it, it, the information he had was really stunning. I mean, down to like each like air raid or, 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 or dogfight, exactly how many losses there were from his squadron and from the British squadrons. Uh, how many tons of, uh, uh, of explosives were dropped by the Allies over Hamburg on the night of April 17 in 1944, for example. Uh, stunning. I mean, I don't know how anybody can even figure that out, you know? Isn't that, isn't that wiring? Um, isn't that, isn't that, is that passion because it's important, like hockey players saying, yeah, I passed it to this, or is that and or is that wiring? Is he just wired that way? Well, obviously, he's very particular. He's a pilot for a start. So your attention to detail in minuscule things is incredibly important because you've got to know how high you are up when you're in a dogfight because you lose thousands of feet in just seconds, you know. And dogfights only took 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you only had 20, 30 minutes flying time and you had to get back to your base. Um, they were very quick, but everything was going very quickly. I mean, they're flying around it between two and three hundred miles an hour um, trying to stay alive and trying to trying to kill as well you know take out the the enemy um, so your mind is obviously very particular plus you've got to fly a plane you got to know how much fuel you've got you've got I mean all these things um, uh, with bits of lead flying around puncturing your hydraulic lines and you know stuff like that mm -hmm. knocking out your radio um, so I think uh, the point of it was more he wanted accuracy, and the accuracy was really quite staggering. In other words, how ill-prepared and ill-equipped the Luftwaffe were, really. Yet, from the Allies' side, it was uh, a, a, an enormous sledgehammer of militarism coming across, mechanized military. But they were not as equipped, well-equipped or prepared as, as we all thought back in those days. Um, and that's what was stunning about it. And he said, actually, well, our Luftwaffe squadrons were just getting, I mean, just uh, 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 obliterated by um, the, the British RAF and, and the USAAF uh, with their equipment, you know, the Mustang, P-51, the, the later models of the, the Spitfire. Um, stunning book. But I can't remember those figures and that I'm like damn why can't I retain that kind of information it's not funny well having said that though that means you you did before I mean that was a thing that uh... yeah 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 so so that's one thing about age that I'm finding wow this <laughs> this is you know that that's uh and I've noticed it with musicians of, of my age too remembering even remembering songs like getting a rehearsal one rehearsal just before we go out. We all know the music, and then we're playing, and then I'm going, uh, what happens here? <laughs> my song, yeah. you know, my own music. It's so, and that's what happens. I think you, um, although apparently we, we only use a small part of our brains, there's, um, I guess there's a little trap door where 
the brain says, oh, that's too much. Let's let some out. And it all falls out. <laughs> but I've always, thought, would... I've always thought that's a, that on some level that might be a, a decision and or mindset. Like I've been talking about my thing of going because I'm uh, compiling a I have a shelf here of the interviews on Real to Real, and I've I've uh, I've, I've still got my Studer back there, my big nine thousand pound Studer Real to Real. It's really heavy, but but I say that because as you're writing a book, uh, Jonathan Cain said this. I, I said, well, how do you remember all this stuff? He said, well, I documented some of it, thank God, because I would write, and yeah. so many people are writing books because there's a hunger for, especially your era of music. We're losing so many people. There's and people are conscious of the fact that in in twenty years there will be no Beatles, you know. And make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Music. Mm -hmm.